Let's say you are some kind of farmer or you're designing an irrigation system for a farmer as an engineer and you are tasked with designing some kind of feedback control to keep a reservoir from running out so that the farmer's greenhouse never runs dry and his plants grow and you make money and everyone wins. And <laughs> the way uh, we do this, engineers will do this in practice, uh, is we'll turn to feedback control uh, in which we will utilize uh, theory referred to as block diagrams. And uh, we use those block diagrams to ultimately derive closed loop transfer functions that let us uh, check how the flow of information is occurring in our system and how do we actually respond to uh, disturbances and perturbations as they occur. And so to give a basic uh, diagram of what's going on here. Uh, let's say we have our reservoir here and the level of water will be at some height H and we'll have some kind of valve here that we can control that will open a hose for instance uh, to pour more water into our tank if we need to and uh, leaving our tank uh, leaving our reservoir will go uh, into our greenhouse to water the actual plants. And so what we would have in our system is some kind of uh, sensor that would tell us the water height uh, as it evolves with time. And uh, this would be sent um, to some kind of measuring device, which I will call GM, which will make more sense later. And this measuring device uh, will be uh, sent, will send its um, data to some kind of controller I shall call GC. And from GC, GC will interpret the current measurement along with some kind of set point value. So um, being an engineer, you would know the height of water. There's some kind of maximum height of water allowed in the tank. And if it falls below that or if it goes above it, uh, we need to make a change. So um, we would have some kind of set point value that we are uh, aiming for inside of our tank uh, to not overflow or let it run dry. And from the controller, uh, we will send a signal to some kind of valve operator, uh, I will call, or actuator, I will call GV. And GV will send uh, some kind of uh, signal such as a pressure to an actual mechanical valve to open or close the valve slightly to adjust the actual flow rate going into our system. So we would have F in going in and F leaving our system to go to uh, the greenhouse, for example. And so what uh, we're going to do next is look at how we actually make a block diagram from this to derive a closed loop transfer function. And just so we're clear, um, the process, uh, th th these flows that we're looking at between these blocks, GM, GC, GV, uh, these are transfer functions that are mapping some kind of input to another output. And so in this case, your controller is likely some kind of computer, in which case it's going to be taking in a voltage and it's going to be outputting another voltage. And so that voltage needs to be translated into some kind of pressure to actually operate a valve on the other end of it, which is the reason why we need the GV to map the controller's voltage to a pressure that we can actually operate our valve with. And so uh, to now get down to what uh, we're going to have a uh, block diagram looking like, we will have uh, something coming in called YSP. And YSP is an external signal to our system that we will um, already have defined. So this would be uh, a, a demanded water height in your reservoir. And uh, entering this thing referred to as a sum block, we will have the measured water height, uh, YM. Leaving your sum block, you will have the air that is present in your system if there is any and that will be interpreted by your controller GC, and GC will map this air to some kind of uh, voltage that will go to a valve actuator GV. From the valve actuator GV, 
um, we would adjust the actual flow rate going into your process, uh, and that's commonly called P. And so P is the input to your process GP. And then leaving GP, uh, we may have uh, some disturbances occurring in our system. And uh, these disturbances could be things such as uh, evaporation or uh, rainfall if this is an open system or uh, perhaps there's other sources of air occurring uh, externalities um, so we need to take into account uh, other factors that may be causing our liquid height to change uh, other than what we're directly manipulating and uh, finally leaving our system will be our actual output y which is the um, actual water height and uh, from y we would record whatever the value is with our uh, measurement device gm and gm uh, would uh, map that into uh, ym which we could actually compare and derive our error from and uh, just so we're clear uh, what this thing is is it's referred to as a block diagram and the uh, things to note from this block diagram is as an engineer the only thing we can really manipulate here is our controller because uh, we're very likely going to buy some kind of valve off the shelf and our process is governed by the laws of physics which uh, we can't manipulate uh, explicitly and uh, we don't really have control over rainfall or evaporation rates um, we may have a slight control over it, but um, there could be infinitely many sources of air coming into our system that uh, we just can't take into account. So we will take those into account via this kind of uh, GD uh, transfer function block, and uh, we end up with a block diagram. And so uh, as an engineer, we'll then take these block diagrams and derive closed loop transfer functions, I abbreviate it CLTF, and these can actually go into uh, programs like Simulink, uh, which, are in which is in MATLAB, uh, which allows us to actually model how perturbations will uh, affect our actual output Y. So if we wanted to know if all of a sudden um, uh, we had a huge shower the night before. How would our uh, water level in the tank evolve with time as the controller was trying to respond to it? Um, we could do that in Simulink and actually be able to go to a supervisor or a farmer and tell him or her this is how uh, things are changing over time. And also a thing to note here, uh, so these closed loop transfer functions are different from open loop transfer functions in that we have feedback. So the, the key thing here is we have feedback being taken into account. And this is critical because uh, we, uh, if we didn't have this segment of our uh, block diagram, we would be blind to anything happening um, if, if there were any disturbances occurring, any externalities. Um, we now can actually take those into account and have our controller respond to them and uh, maintain a uh, water level in our reservoir with some degree of precision. And to wrap this up, uh, going from this actual block diagram that we've just derived of our uh, physical system, um, getting that closed loop transfer function is the next step that we would take um, in order to start designing the controller. So the next step will be to design a good controller to match whatever needs we had. So um, perhaps it's okay if the water level is within one or two feet of some desired set point value, or uh, maybe we need to very quickly respond to some kind of uh, rainfall if it, if it is a huge problem in this particular area or evaporation is a big deal um, and we need to take that into account or other health and safety concerns. Um, and so designing the good controller uh, will come from 
uh, modeling things in Simulink with our closed loop transfer functions. And so um, I do have a video that discusses how we go from the closed loop transfer functions into, or how we actually derive these closed loop transfer functions from our block diagrams um, so we can actually begin to design these kinds of controllers. And so I hope this uh, provides some kind of good introduction to uh, feedback control and uh, closed loop transfer functions and why we need them and how they're useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.